Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Mark Leggett. I'm the Executive Director for Research Data Canada and also uh, co-chair for RDA Council. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our uh, closing keynote speaker for today. Uh, and I would again bring uh, people's attention to a couple of messages that were put in the chat regarding access to technical support if you need it while you're on the call and also how to access the uh, interpretation function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, if this uh, session is being delivered in English, so if you'd like to hear it in Spanish, then that option is available to you uh, at the bottom of your screen. So uh, it's my pleasure again to be able to introduce Sujivan Ratnasingham. Uh, Sujivan is a uh, Associate Director of Informatics uh, for the Center of Biodiversity Genomics and the Chief Ar Architect of the BOLD system. Uh, and you'll hear a lot more about these. The BOLD is the primary engine that underlies the uh, Barcode of Life system. Uh, he's also the Chief Architect of Embrave, which is uh, a high throughput sequencing extension to BOLD. Uh, so Sujiban is a, a key uh, participant in these international global systems. Uh, his work focuses on the application of machine learning and high performance computing approaches towards high volume DNA sequencing and biodiversity data analysis. Sujiban is also the founder of LifeScanner, uh, which is a conser conservation technology initiative that provides DNA based species identification tools to citizen scientists, schools and NGOs. Uh, I've just checked out LifeScanner myself uh, recently. It has a, an app. Uh, it's a great way to engage uh, citizen scientists and, and uh, younger folks uh, in this, the science of biodiversity and species identification. So just another example of the forward thinking activities of the creative team from the University of Guelph and its partners. And maybe just on a personal note, I first met uh, Sujivan earlier this year uh, in February at uh, an event that a Research Data Canada facilitates every year here in Canada called the National Data Services Framework Summit. And my original graduate uh, work was in uh, biology. Um, so aside from a personal interest in biodiversity and the links to climate change and things like that, um, I also have an interest in things of a Star Trek nature. So I had heard about the Barcoding Life Project uh, a number of years ago. So having an opportunity to, uh, to meet Sujivan and listen to his uh, presentation uh, about the, the various projects that he's gonna talk about today was, was great. So, um, and I should also uh, indicate that um, Sujivan has indicated that he will do his best to, and I see he's, logged into the session. So we're gonna, we have a recording of Sujivan's presentation, uh, but Sujivan will be, uh, is here. So he'll be available to respond uh, to questions. So if you do have questions during the session, uh, please put them in the Q&A panel and uh, I will uh, facilitate and uh, pass those questions on to Sujivan. So without further ado, if we can run the uh, recording and I will turn off my video. Thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, to, to be with all of you. Um, I also want to thank the organizers um, of the Research Data Alliance plenary session. Um, uh, I'm quite pleased to have the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'll be talking about two platforms, Bold and Embrave. Uh, they're purpose-built uh, research data platforms in the biodiversity domain. And I want to use these two, um, two systems as examples of, uh, of an approach that um, can, can work very well in, in, in the biodiversity domain, potentially others, um, with a focus on, on design, user experience, and, and workflow, or what I'm calling purpose-built, um, and, and how that could result in a, f uh, a better data outcome than, than purely focusing on, on data concepts. So um, before we dive into the platforms, I think uh, we could spend a little bit of time talking about background. 
Um, the biodiversity domain uh, in particular is um, a, a straightforward uh, field of research uh, that, that focuses on um, taking uh, observational data uh, either through surveys or sensors or remote sensing and most recently um, uh, DNA sequence analysis and converting that into a three-axis framework of taxonomy, time, and space um, as an intermediate uh, data model um, that's very nicely defined as essential biodiversity variables um, in this manuscript by Kissing et al. in 2017. Um, and this, this intermediate uh, data framework uh, then allows us to conduct trend analysis or uh, feed this data into uh, these variables into models that can uh, influence our interaction with the environment or planning uh, for, uh, for use of uh, resources in the environment. So where, where I started getting in, involved in this work was in 2000, 2002, 2003, when I started working uh, in Paul Hibert's lab, uh, a faculty member at the University of Guelph. And um, Paul Hibert uh, uh, had been playing around with this idea that he called DNA barcodes uh, now very commonplace at the, at the time, um, fairly controversial. Um, the use of short DNA fragments to identify species, um, specifically mitochondrial DNA um, from the cytochrome oxidase one gene for animals. And um, that, that concept worked so well that over the last um, 18 years, we've been, we've been working on scaling, scaling that out uh, and have been doing it quite effectively. And what drove that work was um, the recognition that um, what we knew about the uh, one of the axes, the taxonomic axis that defines these environmental biodiversity variables, was uh, impoverished. Uh, so here uh, is a, a knowledge grid um, with colorization applied to areas where we have knowledge of, of the species, the organisms that, that occupy this planet. And based on uh, recent estimates, um, the, the white-gray area is, is our known unknowns. And it's, it's dramatic how much uh, work has, has um, happened over the last 260 years and in contrast to uh, how much work uh, still remains to be done. And this stands as a, a startling backdrop to what's happening in the environment. And here's an article um, from the New York Times talking about the insect apocalypse. And there has been uh, a, a there have been a few studies concluding, uh, long-term studies concluding uh, that are showing a massive decline in not just the diversity but but the abundance of, of flying insects um, on the planet. And uh, it's, it's causing alarm. And even more concerning is that we don't really know what's disappearing. Um, and it's hard to know what the impact is going to be without knowing what roles those, those organisms play and, and how that's going to impact us um, in the many years to come. And uh, it's studies like this that uh, drove the World Economic Forum, which puts out um, a, a risk uh, assessment um, based on surveys, um, global risks report every year. Um, and at the start of 2020, um, all five of the top risks involved um, environmental factors with biodiversity loss being, being number four on the list. Now, um, Maybe it will be bumped to number five um, because this was pre-pandemic with the pandemic being the, the top, um, top risk or pandemics being the top risk. Um, but one could argue that even the COVID-19 pandemic is tied to our interaction with the environment and biodiversity loss um, and our lack of knowledge 
about the the biodiversity that we're dealing with and and the roles and and um, factors that they're involved with. So um, once we'd proved out uh, the viability of a DNA barcoded world uh, in 2010, uh, a consortium was founded of uh, 20 plus nations to deal with the, um, the scientific work of, of rolling out and, um, and conducting this work, um, as well as the, the building of infrastructure to support researchers involved in, in this work. And the Oddball Consortium uh, originally ran from 2010 to 2015 um, and was highly successful. It met all its goals. And um, over the last couple of years, we've been looking at how that you know, could be restarted and extended. And this consortium had a, a two-tier model with member nations that would provide funds um, and infrastructure and associate members, which held most of the world's biodiversity, but could participate um, by leveraging the infrastructure and, and, and funding from, from the other nations so that there would be um, a balancing of, of effort throughout the world. And um, through that work, we, um, we collected data across the globe at varying depths in, in different areas, but creating a quite comprehensive and rich uh, database of, of DNA-based species occurrence data. Um, about 9 million records thus far with uh, over 5,000 published data sets and uh, 4,000 publications associated with this work. So uh, quite incredibly successful by, by any standard. Um, and because of this success, uh, we started a new, uh, new. We started planning the next two phases of this work. Uh, one is uh, BioScan, which uh, has already started, slowed by the pandemic, but uh, involves thirty nations to build out observatories that um, will start collecting this data on an ongoing basis and. Um, build out the technology not just to look at individual occurrences, but their interactions as well through through DNA sequencing. So adding another dimensions to the um, the EBVs um, that that we started with, um, and in 2026 to uh, connect all of these uh, observatories together to form planetary biodiversity observation network, um, a project called. Planetary Biodiversity Mission, which will involve over 50 nations. So these, these activities and this initiative, or these two initiatives, are going to produce a massive amount of data, uh, just as the, um, you know, the Eyeball project did, but uh, obviously orders of magnitude greater as time, time goes on. Um, and so from the outset, we we realized that we needed cyber infrastructure to, to support the work that we were doing. Um, and we looked at leveraging existing cyber infrastructure, the NCBI um, and, and GBIF and a, and a few others that were there that were already capturing all the different elements that, that we needed to work with. Um, but we decided uh, very early on at the start of this work, of uh, DNA barcoding work, that what we needed was something purpose-built. Um, because we recognized that there was a big skills gap um, that we needed to, to address. But on top of that, um, we were doing interdisciplinary work and we didn't want too much fragmentation of, of this data. Um, which which would reduce its usability and and utility. So in two thousand five, Bold was built, and because of its success, it's now in its fourth version, and and certainly has uh, for a data platform has been in operation for quite some time. Um, we we saw additional needs, and we've we started work on a new platform, complementary but new platform, uh, the called the Multiplex. Um, barcode research and visualization environment in 2018. 
And so let's let's start by uh, looking at bold carefully. Um, so a system like this uh, uh, really had to solve four uh, challenges. One, we needed data standards, uh, centralized databases, um, and we needed to support secure collaboration because biodiversity work um, did not happen in any single institution. It is as diffuse as uh, as any discipline can can be, um, and uh, then we needed to um, provide analytical support to to do this work. Now, uh, most of the databases available at the time focused on centralization and consolidation, um, and then uh, data standards, but did not really consider the other two areas that we needed to focus on, um, and this is where. A purpose-built platform can uh, can start to move uh, and and do new things that um, a general system uh, usually wouldn't do. So um, it's best uh, best explained by looking at the bold records. Uh, so bold has a dichotomous record um, because it deals with really uh, uh, originally. What was two domains, two fields of uh, of research? One was the classical museum systematic uh, specimen focus work on the left, um, which is the traditional occurrence based data that biodiversity researchers work with, and on the right, the molecular data, the the DNA sequences, the trace files, the primers, everything that was then. In purely in the field of molecular biology and genomics, and and these groups did not mix very well. Now um, there's a lot of cross pollination, but at the time when both started, that was not the case. And so this dichotomous record um, was was unique, where uh, Bold bridged this uh, this uh, chasm that uh, needed to be bridged to allow for this work to continue. Um, on top of that. It had to operate at multiple scales along uh, an order of magnitude scale. Uh, on the left, we have single researchers um, working uh, on, you know, on their own projects, collecting organisms, analyzing them, um, uh, to museum, uh, museums working on projects, uh, new collections using mass collection devices like um, this malaise trap or a variety of other traps that are used in, in um, aquatic, marine, and, and terrestrial environments um, to complete surveys of national parks like this one, uh, the Algonquin National Park that's been in Canada, uh, fairly heavily surveyed using this method. Um, and the reason it was important to support these scales is uh, because what we found was that each one of these scales um, addressed a different gap uh, in in the um, in the taxonomic landscape. So we had to have a system that supported all of them instead of just the the, the largest scale. Now, um, the data standards, which we started on at the at the outset, which follows uh, the the common. For, for areas that one would expect for data standards, quality, completeness, um, the loci because it's molecular data um, and criteria for provenance of, of the data. Um, and what we realized at the time was that we needed uh, a three-party solution to, to make this work. Uh, the, 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 a consortium to provide capacity building and, and, and training, um, uh, uh, cyber infrastructure to serve as a vehicle to go from uh, researchers starting work to, um, to making data available in public repositories and a, an enforcer or a community watchdog like the NCBI, which had strong relationships with journals to ensure that standards were being complied with. And so this, uh, this model worked incredibly well. Um, and continues to do so. In terms of analytics, um, the reason for the analytics was 
to, to maximize data visitation. There are many databases where data is uploaded and it's not visited, it's not reviewed, it's not accessed. It can, um, it can end up um, just being an element that, that sits there hardly accessed. And what that uh, creates is a, a non-uniform uh, fitness for use, um, which can um, reduce trust in a, in a, in a data resource. So um, Bold was integrated with built-in analytical tools supported by um, its own compute infrastructure, uh, everything from some basic GIS tools to um, DNA sequence analysis tools, but most importantly, interdisciplinary tools that would allow researchers from one discipline or another to bridge the gap so that they could, they could work with the other data through their own lens. Um, uh, a really good way to, um, to look at that or best example of that is is the tree tool in the top left here where um, uh, morphological or ecological data can be automatically put onto the nodes of a tree. So you're essentially looking at that data through the lens of um, molecular relationships in, in the data records, which ends up being powerful on its own, um, but a, even more important because it bridges uh, knowledge gaps. And this is, is aided by um, an adaptive life cycle. Now, um, the adaptive life cycle is really needed because um, with, with uh, data visitation tools, the analytical tools, um, what ends up happening is data is revisited and reanalyzed many times um, because the iterations in the life cycle can occur so frequently um, that you, you end up smashing old data against new data very frequently. And so what we support is um, for minimal data to be entered into the system and then el data elements to be added by the original provider or by other uh, researchers working with them. And so that allows for a division of responsibility and, and bringing the right experts to bear on different different problems, um, and on top of that, uh, we uh, allow for application specific extensions because we recognize that um, each one each field is also evolving and changing in the work that they look at, as is technology and access to it, um, and so this additive life cycle stands in contrast to what occurs conventionally where you wait until you have a complete record and then you put it in a, in a repository. Um, the problem with that is there is this sense of completeness without validation. The data flow of the system uh, is straightforward. Um, what we end up doing is uh, researchers push data into the system, uh, work with it, validate it, and once it's complete as a, a validated data set, it gets pushed out, gets pushed out through public APIs as well as to um, repositories. Now, users don't have to use Bold to, um, to generate this kind of data. Um, there are, you can use a range of tools and, and deposit this data in, in other repositories. So what we end up doing is, is um, pulling that data when it's deposited back into Bold so that it can, it can be aggregated with, with new data that users of Bold produce. Um, and it creates this very useful churn of not just validating new data that's being created, but revalidating data that's been uploaded to uh, other repositories. And, and so this data gets pushed out um, once complete to institutional databases, regional, national ones. Um, and we're hoping as, as things go forward that we, we push more aggressively to thematic databases like Catalog of Life and, and GBIF. And, and this model has worked remarkably well. Um, we're uh, approaching uh, 9.9 million species barcoded. Um, and so the diversity of, of these records 
continues to grow on a linear scale. But our hope is that um, the, the slope of this line, as you can see through the various stages of development of, of this platform, the slope of the line continues to, to increase with each, each new initiative. Um, and because this, this system has been so effective in pushing out data sets, it was recently inducted into Clever, it's a data citation index uh, as an authoritative repository. Uh, a platform that was purpose-built um, being treated as a, um, an authoritative repository for a broad set of data elements is, is an unusual set of circumstances, but I think it speaks to the bridging of that knowledge gap um, that, that Bold provides. <clears throat> and lastly, um, I want to talk about the collaborative networks, the secure data sharing that, that Bold provides. In, in 2005, when Bold was uh, first launched, it had 102 users from 30 institutions, and data sharing was very easy. Um, but uh, as the number of users started to grow, um, it became clear that we needed a framework to share this data securely, so that um, work, so that expertise could be brought to bear on different uh, different uh, blocks of data. Or, uh, I mean, one could call them silos until they're released. Everyone works in silos in the research, uh, uh, in research until they make the data publicly available for use. So um, Bold has a secure uh, data sharing framework that allows researchers to form their own communities um, and share data to, to run um, research networks or labs at a very small scale or to national or international scales. Um, and we observe some very interesting patterns from the name, from the way that that data sharing has developed over uh, the last decade. This is a, um, a data sharing network or a social network um, where the lines above the bar uh, represent data sharing that's occurring across nations and lines below the bar uh, represent data sharing that is occurring um, within a nation. As you can see, the amount of data sharing across nations is, is considerably greater than, than within, within nations. And this speaks to the, the nature of biodiversity work. Expertise is, is spread uh, across the world and to be able to access that expertise and, and work together um, uh, a focused platform uh, is required to facilitate this and to, to streamline it. Uh, again, going back to the, the rapid and, and frequent iterations. Um, so aside from those four factors that um, help bold bridge some of these knowledge gaps to allow such a large number of users to contribute, um, to, to this data and maintain a high fitness for use. There are two other factors uh, associated with the data schema that, um, that help make this happen. Uh, and Bold employs a layered data schema, um, which most systems do, most research systems do now. But there are two ways this data is extended through context specific extensions and annotations. I'm just going to take a deep dive into. Um, one example of each one of these. It's the best example of um, a context-specific uh, extension is the barcode index number system. It's, it's a concept and, and a system that uh, uh, was published in, in 2013, um, heavily utilized now. Uh, it's a combination of an algorithm and a registry. The algorithm um, uh, is based on the concept that if you can identify a species based on on its DNA barcode sequence, then there must be some information about species boundaries within those sequences, which we find to be true. Um, and the algorithm works to uh, infer those boundaries and create groups that are um, de novo species or operational species. And then those 
connections are stored in a registry and made useful um, in reconciling um, issues or curation activities, or even as um, placeholders for species that have yet to be, uh, to be named. And a good example of this is um, in 2013, uh, three initiatives, three collection initiatives were underway. One, Dan Jansen in, in beautiful Costa Rica um, uh, had collected this moth uh, and named it Oratia Jansen 03. Obviously, DNA barcoded it, uh, exists in bold. Um, a, a collection initiative was at the University of Florida going through their collection and um, barcoded uh, a specimen labeled Noted Plusia illustrata. And um, uh, Paul Hebert led a, a research group uh, in ANIC, uh, the Australian National Insect Collection in Australia, um, to where they barcoded uh, a similar looking moth named uh, Tinoplusia spa ANIC 1. The bin system runs continuously analyzing new data as it comes in, and it, it analyzed these three barcodes and said, um, Definitively, uh, these are one species. I'm going to call them bold AAF2716 as a serial number. Um, and so that serial number is now attached with, with all the specimens of, of these three names. Now, these three names don't exist any, any longer because it turns out it's, there's only one species, Nodiplusia illustrata. Uh, its type locality uh, is St. Lucia in the Caribbean. <clears throat> And uh, its story is that it was brought over to uh, Australia as a biocontrol for this lantana plant. And um, like some biocontrol stories, uh, the species became commonplace and, and the connection was, uh, was lost in, um, in time. Um, but the bin system has allowed this reconciliation to occur quickly and seamlessly um, without using a lot of researcher power to go through and, and curate. It's almost triggered curation. And we can see the power of this by looking at um, a model group, Saturnidae. It's a small, uh, charismatic family of, of moths and um, well studied as a result. But at the same time, um, we find all sorts of problems in there when we compare the bins to the species. Um, and when we look at the comparisons of bins and species, uh, we can see one of four potential scenarios. One is a one-to-one -one relationship, where, uh, such as this one here, where uh, all members of the species also have just one bin. Other cases like uh, merges, where we have members of multiple species, all members of multiple species, um, being grouped together into a single bin. We call that a merge. Um, and the, uh, the opposite, where um, a single species gets separated out into multiple bins. All the members fall into multiple bins. And the last, a mixture, where it's actually a mixture of merges and splits. Um, uh, really just, just a jumble uh, where um, multiple members of, of a given species can, can share a bin with another member of the species. Um, but also end up being merged and, and split. So what we generally find is, is that merges, uh, such as the one here, are because um, uh, a taxonomist oversplit the species based on um, a minute morphological difference, uh, sometimes real, um, uh, where those species are real, but what's happened is um, a... Uh, an, well, I wouldn't say an issue, but um, more uh, biological phenomenon that has caused those sequences to be more similar than one would usually expect. Um, the, the split case, such as this one, uh, there, are, there are a number of scenarios where, uh, where these occur. One is where there are ecological difference. We often find there are ecological differences amongst the different bins, um, which suggests that there are usually multiple species like different host plant or different hosts if they're parasitoids. Um, 
or different ranges. Um, and uh, at times we find that they were previously multiple species and uh, merge through uh, a taxonomic revision and often get reverted back if, if that was the case. Um, whereas mixtures are almost always cases of misidentifications, difficult to identify taxa end up appearing as mixtures. And mixtures, boy oh boy, they are very challenging. And they occur especially when multiple data sets are involved because you've got multiple individuals doing the identifications um, in multiple regions and often with challenging and problematic uh, taxa. So um, let's look at one genus, just one genus within uh, uh, within Sphinx, it's uh, Copaxa. Now Copaxa is a challenging um, genus, but what we can see is that there are many one-to-one -one relationships involved in this. Some splits, some merges, but a lot of mixtures. It is a difficult to identify um, uh, group. And by analyzing this data in this way, having this emergent bin system that, that identifies this, a triggered curation results in this outcome where um, the, the situation is more clear as a subset of of these cases where these uh, extended chains are broken because you do have real splits and real merges, very few mixtures, um, and uh, they end up being uh, supported by other evidence like ecological or um, taxonomic uh, reassessment. So the bin system is a really good example of, uh, of the benefit of this. Now, Talking about the second aspect of this, the annotations, is where we're extending the data through human action. Uh, BALD has one of the richest um, uh, collections of uh, diverse organism images uh, in any single source. And so a tool like this, which is integrated into BALD, um, allows for the extraction of morphometrics from, um, from these images, either through crowdsourcing or researchers working um, with their students to go through and, and annotate this information. It essentially quantifies the data that's in the images for, for use in, in analysis in bold. And I, again, the fact that it's purpose-built um, enables this kind of flexibility, um, which would be more difficult in a general framework, um, because we know that this data is supported by other data elements like taxonomy um, and molecular data and geographical data to be able to integrate this with, with other factors. Um, and again, it gets the computation out of the way. So here's a good example of looking at edge detection so that you can, uh, you can explore different features of the organism images, um, which, which you would often have to bring together a variety of different tools or have um, expertise in, uh, uh, in a set of image analysis tools to be able to, to do. So um, essentially it comes down to um, a single point uh, that I'm trying to get across, that purpose-built does not mean inflexible. Um, in fact, all it means is that the iterations and the workflows are fast and integrated um, and uh, support rapid onboarding. So that's really what uh, this strategy does. And, um, and uh, we wanted to try this strategy on, uh, on another domain. And uh, in 2018, this is what we ended up doing because we noticed that um, the field of metabarcoding was really really picking up with a large number of papers. And this is uh, uh, through the advent of um, uh, next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing, which is it's called now. Um, <clears throat> the ability to generate gigabytes and gigabytes of sequence data from mixtures of samples or individual samples run all together uh, uh, fairly inexpensively. And 
So a massive amount of data was being generated, which was easy to deal with when you were dealing with one study or or two studies um, with very few sites. But the moment you got to a dozen or more studies, it was uh, in excess of 100 gigabytes of, of data, making it very challenging to reuse that data and to vet it for use in subsequent uh, analysis. It's not impossible. It's just these barriers don't really need to be there um, if we want to interpret this data quickly. So we set out to build this platform, the Multiplex Barcode Research and Visualization Environment, with a prioritized set, set of capabilities from storage of the data, then analysis, indexing, supporting discovery, and finally standards, um, because standards were going to be uh, really important based on what we saw. Um, and uh, it supported a fairly straightforward workflow macrobiome, microbiome analysis, which is a collection of uh, either multiple individual organisms or um, environmental samples, the extraction of its uh, DNA, the amplification of target markers, the sequencing of those markers, and the generation of um, taxonomic composition based on those, on those sequences. And usually this tends to be a command line based analysis um, or a series of packages where you're running through what, what ends up being, uh, for the most part, uh, a black box operation. But um, to increase this data visitation, uh, Embrave, as, as indicated from the name, is a highly visualized uh, visualization focused platform that provides insights as to what's happening to the data throughout all steps in its, in its analytical uh, life cycle and uh, has an intuitive um, interface to support, uh, support analysis of, of the data. Um, on top of that, uh, uh, you know, for the first time in this, in this sort of work, we started to see multiple vendors coming out with a broad range of solutions. During the early DNA barcoding work, it was really just one vendor that, that provided the, the most commonly used solution. And it started off that way in this, in this field as well with meta barcoding, um, with Illumina's MySeq, the one that's checked off there, um, that uh, does most of, uh, most of the work. But as a result, um, the, the, the tools available to analyze this data um, we're all focused on the biases, error rates, and idiosyncrasies of that instrument. So in this platform, we've had to um, build out capacity to, to allow for the processing of, of data from other, um, other platforms and also to support combination of this data to, to translate it so that the, the, the data elements are more easily comparable within the, the framework because we want to promote data reuse. Um, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense to keep generating the same data again. Uh, there are still some ongoing challenges. The Oxford Nanopore instrument, in fact, the smallest DNA sequencer on the planet, um, uh, about half the size of my cell phone, has um, some very unusual biases and error rates, still incredibly useful, but its idiosyncrasies are still being worked on so that um, it can be integrated into the system. Um, uh, another key challenge with working with this sort of data is moving around such a large amount of data. So uh, we invested some effort into um, building out a framework that um, uh, works in a similar way to the BitTorrent system where it moves around small packets of data um, and, and adjusts its mode of operation, packet size, um, uh, throughput, retries, um, based on the the network conditions um, so that it doesn't overwhelm any particular network. Um, uh, you know, it, Embrave is a platform meant for global use and um, bandwidth and network conditions are not uniform across the globe. So um, these are the sorts of things that you start looking at um, when you have a purpose-built system that deals with not just the, the skills gap, but um, also the, uh, the access gap that um, uh, is a result of, of the nature of our world.
So um, the, the Dana model also is, is made easier. Um, obviously, the sequence data is, is handled because of the storage capacity of, of Embrave. Um, but because Embrave facilitates all of its own analysis built into the system, backed by um, its own dedicated cloud servers, um, the analysis metadata is already stored in the system and, and is never displaced, um, with sample metadata being set by the, the Eyeball Consortium and the Genomic Standards Consortium. Um, and we're looking at domain-specific extensions based on uh, standards like Envil Gas. Uh, this ends up being more complex than um, DNA barcoding proper, uh, which we started with on Bold. And part of that is, is because of the maturity and the diversity of, um, of this community. It's not just a dichotomous community. It's, it's incredibly diverse. So um, we're still finding ways to uh, establish standards. Um, a good example of how, how this works and how it supports rapid iteration, which is really critical to um, improving the fitness of use of, of data, uh, uh, is, is a workshop that we ran in Trondheim, Norway last year, um, where immediately before the conference, um, we uh, had researchers go out and collect uh, water samples from around the city. Um, and analyze the water samples on a MySeq instrument um, immediately before the workshop. And then the workshop participants all took different pieces of that. Um, and these participants had a range of skill set and experience with, with this type of work. They all worked by uploading the data into Embrave and working together to produce um, a, an outcome. And, and we recovered 15 phyla, uh, 80 orders, and close to 400 species from, from this effort. So this is data that was put on the map um, for use by other researchers. And through the system, we were able to generate these, these figures and um, results looking at the taxonomic composition of each one of these sites. And we were able to infer the cause of these because some of them were wastewater related, others uh, were rivers that had been redirected or um, uh, had uh, other um, uh, hu human factors associated with, um, with their uh, condition. Um, and we were able to look at these, this, these compositional visualizations and data um, on the same day, on the same in this one workshop, um, and uh, start writing the manuscript right there. So this is a really good example of how you can start with raw data and iterate quickly with very little knowledge and still get immense insights. And this paper has been submitted for review and, and publication. It should be uh, fairly soon. And going back to those uh, essential biodiversity variables, um, you can see that uh, within a single day or, or a few days from collection to um, to result, we have the three axes and, and points along all those axes uh, very quickly using a framework like this. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, working with a, a, a broad range of researchers, each bringing their own expertise. So um, I hope that gives you a sense of, of the advantages of, of starting with with a focus on, on workflow and, um, and user experience design uh, instead of just a focus on the data outcomes that we're looking for. But at the same time, there are some pitfalls to, to starting with um, a focus that's not on the data. Um, and we're working hard to address those, uh, those pitfalls, making sure that we we avoid them, um, and we're now in the process of adopting um, fun uh, adopting certifications or seeking certifications like the Core, core Trust Seal, um, employing an a o o the Open API framework to um, standardize our um, our APIs and embrace the fair principles 
um, more aggressively. So, and, and what this is going to do is allow us to integrate to different, um, different organizations and systems along the value chain from collection to um, consolidated data products and um, be able to add value at each one of those points. So with, for example, with Symbiota, a um, collections database that's, that's uh, heavily used in North America, um, to be able to exchange data there. Uh, we already work very closely with GenBank and, and Emble and start to build out our linkages <coughs> with Catalog of Life and GBIF so that we can um, uh, add value at, at those points in the, in the data value chain. So um, I, hope, I hope I've given you an, an opportunity to look at um, perhaps a slightly different approach uh, of, of uh, building systems um, where uh, focus on, on users and, and process uh, does not always and with lower quality of data, it can end up with higher data quality as we've experienced. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, this approach of, of building research data platforms could be useful for others as well. All right, uh, on that, um, I thank you all for your time and for listening. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank my colleagues, Paul Hebert, Evgeny Zarkraft, Dirk Stanky, and many others. Um, that have provided absolutely critical support and advice along the way, um, and our funders um, who make all of this uh, all of this work possible and sustain these uh, these platforms that we want to see continue to operate for uh, the next many years and and hopefully decades. All right, thank you very much. Well, that was great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Sujivan. And I know that you, uh, you've you logged in uh, now, and but you may have to leave uh, earlier. But if you are able to stick around uh, for a few minutes, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so maybe what I'll do is just uh, read them out in the order that they've come in, uh, Sujivan. So the, great, uh, the first one is great talk, uh, spectacular work. Uh, pulling all this together obviously required an enormous effort in terms of design, coding, meetings, etc. That your last slide may have given a sense of this if somebody was counting quickly, but can you say how many staff are presently involved in running the curation and annotation workflows and all the rest of the stuff involved in, in Bold and Embrave? Yeah, sure. Th thank you, Mark, and, and thank you, uh, Claudia, for the question. Mark, I just want to confirm that you can hear me. Yes. Yep. Ah, perfect. Okay. Um, so it varies over time because the work is supported through multiple grants that that overlap and address different different parts of the uh, the system. Um, it ranges anywhere from sixteen to about twenty people, um, and that's been uh, sustained over the last, I would say, uh, maybe eight years. Uh, obviously, before that, in the early stages of this development, it was a, a small core team, much like development of any any platform um, of about uh, six or seven people. But for the last eight years, we've been able to maintain a, uh, a fairly large staff, uh, very high retention as well, uh, average retention of about uh, four to five years for, for most of the staff. Um, now, I, if you're able to see the questions, Sujivan, did you want to go ahead with the next one or do you want yeah, me to? Yeah, uh, happy to. And I note that okay. uh, Claudia had another question, Embrave. Uh, the question is also Embrave is equal to, uh, is it an evolution from Bold or is it a companion? How easy, hard was it to design considering your careful development and evolution of Bold? Um, so it is, uh, Embrave is a separate platform, um, uh, but you, you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, it was a very challenging decision on how to proceed such that um, we would not increase the, the challenge of maintaining uh, the platform uh, by increasing complexity and the dependencies um, in the code and complexities added to the data model. So Embrave is a separate platform, but has hooks into Bold, very deep hooks into Bold um, uh, through, through APIs. So no direct connection. They both share a single sign-on. 
um, so that data can flow very seamlessly between the platforms. Um, but all functionality is complementary, uh, such that you could have both platforms open at the same time and, and do the work, sort of like having Excel and Word open at the same time to, to do different parts of, uh, of your work. The next question is from uh, Robert uh, Hanish. Uh, I don't understand how this work connects with GBIF, complementary, parallel, integrated. Um, it is complementary with the work that, um, uh, that GBIF does. In fact, we've got many records from Bold um, that exist in, uh, in GBIF, but there isn't a, a formal relationship uh, with GBIF, uh, but that is starting to change with a recent grant from uh, the Canary Initiative in Canada. Um, and we've brought in the former um, executive secretary of GBIF, Donald Holborn, um, who's involved in that project to help facilitate this integration. So we will be pushing data points into GBIF um, and also pulling data points from GBIF very much the same way that we work with NCBI. On top of that, we'll be adding a catalog of life because there are different data elements in bold um, and Symbiota. So uh, they will be a, a bilateral exchange of data, very complementary, no redundancy um, in, in effort, as far as I can tell. Uh, obviously that will change with time. And I don't think there is anything wrong with some redundancy in effort. Um, because you get innovation when trying to reinvent some small pieces of the puzzle. Um, the next question was, uh, is from, oh, this changes as we go. I see Dimitri on there. Um, uh, next question is from Claudio, uh, Claudia again. Another question, uh, is there any kind of interoperation with GBIF on any national multinational biodiversity system. And so I think this was answered already. Um, but I will add one clarification, is that um, our interaction with GBIF is not on a national level, but on an international level. So we don't see flowing data through national nodes, but directly between GBIF and, and BOLD and eventually uh, Embrave. Uh, next question from, or I think it's more of a comment from Dimitri. Thanks for explaining Bold to GBIF connection as well. Greetings from GBIF. Hi, Dimitri, good to see you on the call. Um, uh, uh, the, the next question or comment perhaps from Rob Hooft. You clearly show the adva advantages of the tight integration of data and analytics platforms. Do you see special merit in the alternative or standardization of data found in different places? that would not only make it possible to collaborate with other organizations, but also being able to use your analysis on data elsewhere. And also for others to write analysis that can be used on your data. You hinted to this in one of your last slides about fair seller model versus hourglass model. Um, Rob, uh, very good point. I think, oh, Rob's comment disappeared for some reason. Uh, no, they moved just, up. Yeah, there they moved up to the top. Ah, okay. Um, uh, Rob, very good point. Um, we are looking for different ways to expand on this model. And the obvious next step is to allow uh, third parties to add analytical functionality. It's, it's this close tie of analytics to, to data that, that is really powerful uh, about this model. Um, and so one thing that we're exploring, uh, exploring is the ability to build our packages that can then be uploaded and vetted using the app uh, app model. Obviously security is a factor that we have to deal with and, and then be able to have those, those R modules callable uh, via user interface because the user interface design is, is definitely critical to the success of this platform. So being able to, to support it in that, that fashion is, um, is an area that, that we're exploring. Um, Allison, uh, Allison Specht, uh, I've known Allison for quite some time. I haven't seen her in a while. Allison, good to, uh, good to hear from you. Um, thanks to Jeevan, I'm thrilled that you found that the user interaction has been valuable. I'm really interested as we move, uh, you move to Core Trust Seal, but how the complexity, how this, oh, no, she's disappeared, just moved up. Um, how this complexity um, has created 
uh, or increase the sustainability of this platform? Do you envision that the user interface may benefit your sustainability? Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, I know Alison Specht through um, an initiative that she was uh, involved with uh, uh, out of the EU around um, interdisciplinary work in, in the biodiversity domain and potentially um, uh, beyond uh, called CESAB. Um, and in fact, we spent uh, a week together once or twice a year uh, in the south of France, along with a bunch of other uh, researchers to try and develop interdisciplinary approaches. So uh, her, her question uh, is very well founded in, in knowledge about the work that we do. Um, Alison, I do believe that um, the user experience design uh, around uh, this, this interface with the user um, is critical to, to the sustainability of, of this platform. Um, so for example, uh, the rate at which data sets are produced and published um, is a big factor in, in getting ongoing funding. Um, certainly the, uh, the uh, certification or validation through Clevariate's um, induction of the system of BOLD specifically into um, their data citation index uh, has been very helpful in getting additional funding. And that's, that's really speaking to the vehicle of moving out this data through rapid iteration. Uh, so I believe that to be the case, but I think time will tell. Um, Rob, another question. You've clearly showed the advantages of tight integration of data analytics. Uh, is this the same question? It is the same question, it just flipped around. Um, last question from Andrew uh, Trillor. Do you anticipate storing the data becoming a limiter to the growth or use uh, of the system uh, as use of the system increases. Um, this was uh, a concern, just as any data platform when you're starting out, um, you worry about data storage becoming a limitation and, and security of that data. Um, you become a, a steward for this data and you have to make sure that you're protecting it. Um, so this, this obviously is a concern. It was a concern at the, at, at the start with Bold less of a concern now because Bold um, lives in the terabyte scale um, and, and terabytes are not a problem to, uh, to store and, and protect at this stage of, of um, what is it, Crendel's Law. Um, uh, but Embrave is a concern because it's quickly moving into the pet petabyte scale. So the way we're dealing with this, one is um, obviously on the fly compression, but really, it, it could it could blow up quite uh, in a in a bad way. So uh, we've built a partnership with uh, NCBI, and NCBI um, has offered us their petabyte storage because we know this next generation sequencing data is going to end up in NCBI. Um, but at the same time, we don't want it to be public right off the bat because that's one of the the reasons users can put data into the system early in, in the life cycle. So um, our, our discussion with NCBI is around keeping that data in holdup until the data is published. And they don't see any problem with that as long as the data is published within a certain time frame. So that, that addresses that issue um, by looking, essentially it's looking for partners uh, who, will, who will maintain the data further on in the, in the value chain and engaging them uh, to provide those resources earlier on. And that seems to uh, work well in this case. We'll see how it goes as we move into the petabyte scale. Um, and I Sujibin, think that's the last question. Sujibin, I don't know if you have time. There's one more question actually from Mark Dietrich. I, it should be at the top of your screen. If it's not, I can uh, ask Yes, it. there it is. Um, Mark, uh, the question is wonderful to get an update on Bold. This community might wonder about centralized approaches sustainability opportunities to engage partners who are concerned about sovereignty over an aspect uh, of their uh, patrimony, et cetera. Any thoughts about this going forward? Yeah, it's, it is a concern. Um, Bold is a, um, is a platform that's run out of a university, um, but at the same time, it's gotten to the point where um, an international consortium uh, 
governs its its operation and 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 um, <clears throat> provides feedback on on what happens. Um, but there are, of course, concerns about sovereignty. I didn't speak about the the data ownership model. I pulled it out of this this talk. I usually talk about it, but. Um, our ownership model is that the providers of the data, the, the submitters of the data own the data. Um, uh, we don't follow the library model. It's much more like a, a Wikipedia model where the community owns it. Um, so uh, if at any point uh, uh, an institution came to us and said, we have produced every aspect of this data, we wanna move it off, we would honor that, that agreement. Um, unless it's published in a manuscript, unless it, it meets the, the requirement for public domain after going through the, the standard process. But at the same time, we want to support sovereignty without getting to that point where it's adversarial. So um, what we're doing is working with agencies where possible to push out the data, but also make a platform like Bold available to, to be hosted um, in a in a different um, in a different nation. So yeah, Mark, thinking about distributed approaches. So this is something that we're working on. We have a project uh, currently funded by UNEP. Um, we've gone through a. Uh, uh, we're pretty close to. I, I'd say maybe it's premature, but we're pretty close to final approval to set up a second version of Bold in South Africa, um, supported by the. Uh, South African government, uh, a multi-agency um, task force will, will take this on. Um, and what will happen is a two-tier system will be uh, developed where the data will live in South Africa until it's voluntarily pushed so that it goes into global bold. So we'll essentially have South African bold. Um, and hopefully this model will take off where other nations with interest at the national level can set up their own platform. Now, there are a cost to this because you need to have the cyber infrastructure in place. You need to have the IT staff dedicated to this. Um, as we've seen from, uh, from the GBIF distributed model, it takes a while to get the resources in place for this to happen. So we are embracing that sort of approach, but it's, uh, it's taking longer because of the computational requirements of a system like Bolt. The built-in analytics um, is, is the main challenge. But I'm confident as the cost of computing gets lower and as the size of Bold gets, gets bigger and the database that's there uh, gets bigger that more nations or additional nations will step up to, to take this on. Uh, Mark has a comment. Uh, we should discuss a global Bold in context of efforts for global open sciences commons where the infrastructure is easier than the policies. Agree 100%. Um, so uh, yes, you know it's important to separate out the um, the data commons and the infrastructure commons, um, and obviously on the on the data side, we're going to be working with organizations like GBIF, um, Catalog of Life, to make sure that we contribute to those data commons outside of just producing uh, a resource that sits in Bolt proper. Well, that's an excellent. Uh response to a lot of questions, uh, Sujivan, so I appreciate that. Uh, I think I can also say fairly confidently that RDA has over just over 100 working groups and interest groups, and I think your talk has touched on or has a thread connecting your talk to just about every one of those 100 <laughs> plus working groups and interest groups, whether it's from the standards context or or the cultural uh, aspects that we, uh, that we see in the open science context. So I really appreciate not just your uh, doing the recording. Uh, I know that uh, people with your engaging speaking style find it uh, sometimes much easier to do it live. Um, so I appreciate that you both did the recording and uh, and signed into the chat, uh, the session today as well. Uh, so many thanks for that. I think you've generated a lot of thoughts and questions that will continue to, to stream through the uh, plenary as we go forward in the next few days. Well, thank you, Mark. It's uh, it's been a pleasure. I, I hope the, you enjoy the rest of the day, uh, um, and I'll sign off. All right. Thank you. I know you have to go. So thank you very much.
Okay. And uh, thanks to all who uh, were able to sign in today. Uh, we certainly had have have had a good launch to the day. Uh, the uh, the RDA uh, team that has been working behind the scenes, colleagues from Costa Rica and the U.S. And the RDA secretary in particular have been working hard with our Streampoint Streampoint colleagues to uh, to bring a, a new experience to you both. Uh, diehard RDA plenary attendees and newcomers. Uh, so many kudos to those in the back. And I look forward to inter intersecting with all of you over the next few days. Thank you all.